it's possible that many of you do not know about the holiday called Purim. We're going to talk about today, that today, the beginning of that holiday. It's in celebration for the victory that the Jews had over evil Haman. And, mm. uh, yay. And uh, it's, it started off as just kind of spontaneous, and then uh, you'll see how it grew from there. But every year, the Jews celebrate that holiday with a lot of fanfare and a lot of fun. Uh, remembering the great victory that they had. So we're going to take a look. We're going to cover two whole chapters today, but it doesn't really count because chapter 10 is only like three verses long. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to begin with chapter 9, verse 1. And how did she... Okay, she went through to verse... Uh, there's more than one page. Okay, well, let's, let's go back to the very first page and see how far she went. Come through nine, and all the nobles. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to start reading. <laughs> <laughs> On the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. But now the tables had been turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities, in all the provinces of King Xerxes, to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them, because the people of all the nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, the king's administrators, helped the Jews, because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased, to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed Hashem Dadatha, Dalpan, those other guys, and the ten sons of Haman, the son of Haman Dadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Let's pray. Father, speak to us through your word this morning. Give us wisdom and insight not just information. Help us to see how it is we can serve and live for you today. And Father, our hearts go out to those who are under threat of the fire to our west. We ask you to give safety to the firefighters. We ask you to give victory to them that they can overcome this fire and contain it. We pray for those who are in the line of fire that you would protect lives, protect their houses, and make this be over, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, even though, I told you this last week, they had two edicts. One to kill the Jews, one that the Jews can kill their enemies. And the officials, government officials, went with the second one to protect the Jews and the Jews can, can attack their enemies. Even though that was in place, there was still confrontations all over the empire. In Susa alone, 500, I like the way it says it, were killed and destroyed. Uh, and what that means is not exactly 500 people were killed and then once they killed them, then they destroyed them. What that means is they were either killed or their lives were messed up. They, it covers all the bases is what it does. That's why the, the ten sons of Haman, thank you, were, are then hanged later. Okay, so they were captured at this point. But uh, Mordecai's authority is unquestioned by the by the leaders because they're afraid of him. 
He has great power. It's kind of like, if you go and look at the book of Daniel, he also rose to a position of great power, and the princes and the leaders in the government were afraid of him, and they used every trick they could to try to overcome Daniel. It didn't work. So with Mordecai, this is after Daniel, with Mordecai, they're being more circumspect. They're going along with it. And let's see, how far did I get? I, I read the whole thing. Okay, so I can cover the whole thing. Wait a minute, I didn't read the whole thing. Where did I go? I went to verse 9, yeah. Okay, oh, I see what I did. Okay. Getting ahead of myself here. So, verse 11. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that day. The king said to Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your position? It will be given to you. What is your request? It will be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, Give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be impaled on poles. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa. They impaled the ten sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa three hundred men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. So, you can almost hear the king's concern in this written report. 500 men have been killed in Susa. What's going on in the rest of the empire? You can almost hear him sigh when he says to Esther, what else do you want? She asked for another day so that it can be continued because obviously there's more political intrigue going on in the capital and that's where they want to uh, stamp it all out. i got to tell you, at times I read this and I go, yay for our side, we're killing everybody. Uh, <laughs> we just think differently today than they did in those days. Yay for our side, we're killing all our enemies. So another 300 are put to death in the capital of Susa. But the one light that shines in this is that even though the edict of the king allowed them to plunder their enemies. They did not plunder their enemies. They left it. It's it's a sign of contempt is what it is. I don't even need your stuff. Verse 16. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th, and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That's why rural Jews, those living in the villages, observed the 14th of the month of Adar, the day of joy and feasting, the day for giving presents to each other. Just, you know, a little procedural matter here. So, throughout the empire, some 75,000 are killed. And again, it must have been, you know, Mordecai must have included this in his letter that he sent to the Jews. Again, the, the plunder is refused. They don't enrich themselves from it. And because of that extra day in Susa, there's a difference between the way the Jews in the countryside celebrate the, the holiday and the way the Jews in the city celebrate it, because there were two days. So some are celebrated on the 14th and some celebrated on the 15th. I read all this and I go, yeah, yeah, i got to tell you, up to this point, I'm just giving you history. I'm just giving you, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. I want to find a little more in here. I want to find more than just a history lesson. Why is God telling us this stuff? 
Look at verse 20. Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemy, as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them to observe the day of, the day of days, the day as days, of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. <clears throat> Mordecai's letter took what was a spontaneous celebration throughout the empire and standardized it into a two-day event, a big holiday, something. For the Jews, it's kind of like the 4th of July and Christmas all rolled into one. It's a deliver. It's, it's like uh, the Exodus, when God delivered the Jews from Egypt. It's like Calvary, when the cross of Christ overcame death and destruction, and we now have eternal life in Christ. It is a deliverance from God. It's right for them to celebrate that deliverance, and it's kind of a shame that we don't know much about it. That's one of the great things that God has done for His people. We ought to celebrate, too, when God works in our lives. It ought to be a big deal for us. Uh, I, people, Some people get upset about Christian holidays because they say they have pagan backgrounds. So, uh, I, I don't celebrate paganism when I celebrate a Christian holiday. I celebrate God. Uh, I believe in redemption, and I believe God can redeem, redeem pagan holidays as much as he can redeem me. So, I don't have a problem with giving God the glory, which is essentially what we're doing when we do that kind of a thing. Verse 23. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they'd begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman... <laughs> The son of Haman Dadatha the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued, you haven't heard this before, have you? He issued written orders that the scheme, evil scheme of Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his son should be impaled on the pole. Therefore, these days are called Purim, from the word Pur, because of everything written in this letter, because of what they had seen, and what had happened to them. So, like I said, the celebration started out as spontaneous, but Mordecai's letter, his decree, makes it official imperial policy. And the holiday comes to be called Purim, out of, out of Pur. And it's a pun, by the way. You may wonder, well, what, what does that mean? Yeah, why do we call it Purim? Well, Pur meant casting lots. If you remember from chapter 2, I guess it was, Haman cast lots to determine what was the best day to destroy the Jews. And so, because of Haman's dicing, or whatever you want to call it, however they cast lots to do it, because of that, Casting lots came to mean the day of destruction, but just like our term Yankee Doodle, it was turned around. Ha! In your face! We won! And so, it's called Purim because Haman gambled and lost. And they celebrate that because it's the exact opposite. I had someone come up to me one time and say, Don't you know that the cross is a symbol of shame? I said, yeah, I know that. Didn't you know that? It's a symbol of shame that's been turned to glory because of what God did with it. Verse 27. The Jews took it on themselves to establish the customs that they and their descendants and all who would join them should without fail observe these two days a year 
in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation, by every family, and in every province, and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants. So, Mordecai's decree establishes Purim as an official holiday, but it's left to the Jewish people to work out the details of how they do it and the things that they celebrate and do. It's still celebrated today with great enthusiasm. Purim is a picture of God's nick of time deliverance, which he specializes in. He loves to wait, not in movies, if the bomb's going to blow up, they always wait till the last second before they defuse the bomb. God waits till three seconds after. <laughs> he always does it after everything should fall apart and be destroyed. I wish he'd stop doing that. I, you know, I want the bomb to be defused before it's set. But that's not the way it works. Purim is a picture of God's nick of time deliverance and it is a promise that God delivers his people. That you can call upon God. That you can cry out to God. That you can seek God to deliver you. You know, there's that scene in uh, Three Amigos where it, they try to make it corny and maudlin where every one of us faces an El Guapo and it might be not being able to read. You know, really corny like that. It's kind of true, you know. Your Purim might be something really stupid to somebody else. But you can call out to God and you can seek God because he is the God who delivers. Verse 29. So, Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm his second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated times. As Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther decreed for them, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants, in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. Okay, when I read that, verses 29 through 32, I said, yes, thank you. I believe I've read that several times. You have here a good example of how the Jewish writers of the Bible think. In the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you'll see it in the New Testament too, but in the Old Testament, when you see repetition it means this is important. Pay attention. I'm going to tell you again. Did you get it last time? Here, let me tell you to it again. When they repeat it, it means you should pay attention to this. Okay? Instead of my response, ho-hum. So, Esther and Mordecai become written into the official records of the Persian Empire. And the inclusion of this episode in Scripture tells us that God remembers too. It's kind of like in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's chapter, I'm doing this off the top of my head, chapter 3 or chapter 5 describes all the people that rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. And it's really boring. Bob built the wall from this gate five feet past his house, and Ted built the wall from that point seven feet past his house. And this whole chapter is really annoyingly boring. And the silversmith did this, and the priest's daughter did that. And you know what it means? It means God remembers every single person of what they did. And that's how important it is. That's what it means. And I'm reading it as a pastor and trying to go, how do I preach this stupid message out of this? And Robin's eating it up and going, oh, look at this. This guy's name is over here. <laughs> God remembers. And it's there in the record. So you can go check it out and see. That's the important part of it. Uh, so, we come to chapter 10.
King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores. And all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews, because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of the Jews. The story ends on a very high note. What does it mean? Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire. What, what is that there for? I'll tell you what it's there for. This is a reminder to the people who read that story the first time of how great Xerxes was. He's so great, he imposed tribute on 127 provinces. Wow! He had that kind of power. Politicians would immediately grasp the nature of that city. Oh, what a guy! Look at the power he wielded! They wouldn't understand that and see that. And Mordecai stood alongside Xerxes, helping. That shows how great Mordecai became. Don't forget Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were all raised up and trained to be leaders in the Persian Empire. Now you look at this and you think, eh, this story might be just a little contrived. Yeah, sure. All that just happened to happen. No, it didn't. It was God's providence. Purim, as I said, is a picture of God's nick of time deliverance. And it reminds us that God has promised to ultimately deliver his people through the death, resurrection, and return of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your power displayed in the lives of your people. Help us, Lord, when it looks like our life is falling apart, to turn to you and not to give in to despair. Lord, be glorified in the lives of this church and the lives of your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.